So thank you, Lawrence. Um, and this is a great opportunity for us. We are very happy to be able to, to give this talk at Google. So um, the, the talk will be organized by uh, uh, different uh, parts, which we will alternately present. So I will first give you an overview of how the project works. And then Andreas will give you some uh, colored uh, tour of what is in Seagal. And then I will uh, go into more technical details concerning the generic programming aspects as well as the exact um, geometric computing uh, that we use of our own in Seagal. And Andreas will uh, finally conclude. Um, so the Seagal project is now uh, 12 years old. It was uh, originally, originally guided by this mission statement, which is uh, to make a large body of geometric algorithms uh, developed in the field, the research field of computational geometry, available uh, for industrial applications. Uh, what it is now is uh, an open source project. There are uh, a few institutional members uh, which make long-term commitments and which are supported by uh, sequent, um, subsequent uh, European research projects. These are INURIA in France, the Max Planck Institute in Germany, Tel Aviv University, Utrecht University, and a few others. Uh, in particular, uh, Geometry Factory, which is a spin-off company of our project, which uh, started in 2003 and uh, which was funded by Andreas. Um, I would say that like for any open source project, we have some development infrastructure, so an SVN repository, bug trackers, etc., and uh, some uh, nightly distributed test suite to check that uh, our C++ code is portable on various compilers. And uh, we also try to make uh, two developer meetings a year uh, in Europe mostly. The typical workflow of the, product, of the project is that we receive some um, new contributions in the form of submission of specifications. And these are reviewed by an editorial board of uh, about uh, 12 persons now. And uh, this board uh, decides and uh, checks uh, for uniformity of the specifications with the rest of the library. Now the value for the contributors uh, is that while well, they get integrated into this larger uh, Seagal community, they gain visibility in this mature project. And we also try to push for a model where uh, accepted contributions have a value equivalent to a publication, which is important for uh, the research domain. Now, some commercial users, uh, which have bought parts of uh, Seagal for various applications, um, <laughs> They come from uh, lots of different uh, application domains, so like GIS, uh, VLSI, medical imaging, and these are all in need of uh, geometric computing. So we provide fundamental uh, geometric uh, building blocks, let's say. Uh, now let me give some numbers to summarize this, uh, the project as of uh, the current public release, 3.3. So this is a pretty large uh, C++ project now, so about 600,000 lines of code. Uh, it gets downloaded uh, 10,000 times a year, plus it is also part of some uh, major Linux distributions. Uh, the manual is also pretty extensive, so um, 3,500 pages. And there are also a few thousands of subscribers to the, the announcement and discussion mailing list, which are very active. Um, the library itself is not really monolithic. It's more a collection of classes or functions um, for individual data structures, uh, which Andreas will de uh, detail later. And we count them as roughly 100. There are now 60 commercial customers of Seagal and currently about 20 active developers part-time. So, And uh, we try to issue one release a year, more or less. That is what we are heading for. And as far as license is concerned, so Seagal is open source. Uh, there is an open source license which is split between the LGPL and the QPL depending on the parts. And additionally to, to that, there are some commercial licenses which are available uh, through uh, Geometry Factory. Okay, so I will now 
let Andreas give you a tour of Cigar. from the manual pages, squeezing that in 20 minutes will kind of be difficult. So what I will do instead is I give you uh, a tour through Seagull, um, picking out uh, some of the data structures we have uh, and giving a kind of highlight of what's special about this particular data structure. So uh, in the Seagull manual, there are, kind of, there are kind of chapters. So we regrouped uh, all these packages we have in, say, triangulations, uh, Boolean operations, things like that. Okay. Um, when we say... Uh, uh, packages, so when we say uh, software components or building blocks, it's, a, it's C++ classes with very rich APIs, right? I mean, the manual pages are about the API, okay? Uh, don't be afraid about 3,500 manual pages. There are 100 packages, so in average, uh, it's uh, 30 manual pages per package. So it's not a huge thing that you have to study first in order to get started, okay? Um, these data structures what they're based on, what they, uh, the, the kind of foundation, what they run, run on is on the Seagull kernel, and we will speak about that next. So the kernel, it kind of wraps up the elementary uh, types like points, segments, so, so elementary geometric entities, okay? Then next, uh, you have predicates. So predicates are things like uh, an orientation test. So where's my mouse? So you have three points, P, Q, R. They perform a left turn. When you go from P to Q to R, it's a left turn. Those three are collinear, okay? Or things like uh, an in-circle predicate. So you, you, you have three co points, P, Q, R. You have, uh, which define a triangle, which defines a circumcircle. And you want to know for point S, does it lie inside the circumcircle of the triangle? Does it lie outside? Or is it co-circular? Is, is it on the circle, okay? Then the, 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 the third category of things you find in the kernel, it's constructions. Constructions means that you take, you, you take several uh, geometric objects and you compute new entities like an intersection point or given three points, you compute the center of the circumcircle. Okay, these are predicate constructions. And um, uh, those things, uh, they are a little bit tricky to deal with with floating point arithmetic. And uh, Sylvain later will speak about uh, how, to, how to get that stuff, stuff done. So now let's, let's start with uh, this guided tour through Seagull, so there's one big chapter is triangulations. Um, so triangulations is uh, you have, uh, these you have uh, the, as input these blue points, there are points in the plane, and you hook them up with triangles so that, uh, the, the, that, uh, uh, that it's all covered with triangles, uh, okay, that you have a decomposition in triangles. And uh, so there are many p possible triangles, and um, one which is, which is interesting, it's the Delaunay triangulation, which has the property that uh, for all triangles, uh, for all triangles of the triangulation, if you draw the circumcircle around, uh, what we just defined before, there is no other of these blue points which lies inside the circle, so, which makes the triangles uh, um, kind of nicely shaped. Uh, so they are not elongated, because let's have a look. Uh, if, you, if we flipped this edge, uh, so we replace this one by, by that one, uh, this one is not Delaunay, because if you take this triangle, you draw the circumcircle, this, this point, this vertex of the triangulation lies, lies inside it. Okay, that's not, that's not Delaunay. Okay, um, the data structures we provide, they are, uh, they are fully dynamic. That means you can insert, remove a vertices uh, and the data structure gets updated on the fly. So um, uh, they are decently fast. There are kinetic versions, which means that uh, the points, they can fly along trajectories and at discrete time steps, the data structure gets updated, okay? Then um, there are versions of triangulations uh, which can incorporate constraints. Uh, so uh, say uh, um, break, lines, uh, in, uh, break lines in maps or road networks or things like that. And the 2D triangulations, they can be used for terrains. Uh, so terrains are not really 3D, they, they are 2 and a half D. So they are in the plane and uh, each, at each x, y coordinate you have elevation, okay, which, which defines, defines the terrain. Okay. Let's have a look at um, um, some, some application of one of, a, of our users uh, who provided us screenshots. What they do is... Uh, uh, terrain modeling, and um, um, they do watershed analysis. So what you see here is a mountain, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hill in a mine, in a, uh, and uh, um, you see the ramps uh, where the lorries uh, uh, go up to, 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 to deposit uh, material, okay? And so what they have as input is very regular, a very regular grid plus elevation. So uh, yeah, digital elevation model plus constraints. So uh, these are the 
the kind of the road networks uh, on this uh, on this hill. And what they do is uh, they use our the lonely triangulation to to kind of remeasure this quad mesh to a triangular measure. Uh, which, which, has, which has less faces, okay, because the, the watershed analysis needs a, uh, a sparse as possible model, which is still, uh, uh, still good enough uh, to represent uh, the, the real terrain. Uh, I mentioned constraints, so when you have a triangulation like this one, which is rather regular, and if you insert constraints now in red, so these constraints have to be respected. You cannot have triangles that uh, that, that cross a constraint. So in red, you have the constraints. Uh, when the constraints are rather large compared to the average uh, triangle, uh, the average edge of the triangulation, you end up with nasty triangles. So if you run simulations, so, so these are not, these flattish triangles are not very good. So they're for, for, numer well, for num numerical reasons, okay? So um, uh, what, uh, what one user of us, what, uh, of, of the Seagull software, what he did, he used our conforming uh, uh, algorithm, so which, which uh, has the freedom to add additional points on the constraint to make the triangles looking nice, okay? But still, if you look here, for example, you, have, uh, you still have elongated triangles. So uh, what you also have in Seagull is uh, uh, the lonely meshes. Now the additional degree of freedom is uh, the algorithm is allowed to, to add more points uh, uh, not only on the constraints, but uh, also inside the triangles, okay? And uh, now, um, now all the triangles have this Delaunay property, so which, which makes uh, the triangles uh, nicely shaped, okay? Now, let's zoom, uh, if, uh, you can end up with many points because it can be necessary to, to add many points to enforce this Delaunay property, so just this zoom shows uh, uh, because the constraint was, was very close to one of these grid points, uh, uh, you end up with many small triangles, but I mean it's un it's unavoidable. It's uh, it's kind of, of intrinsic to to that. Okay. Another example, um, so of a, of a measure, so doing it on, on North America. Um, in the chapter triangulations, we have the same thing in 3D. Uh, in 3D, um, well, again, it's fully dynamic. Uh, it's uh, it's it's very fast. Um, and uh, in 3D, you don't hook up triangles but you hook up a tetrahedra, okay? The, the tetrahedra, that they, what they do, they decompose space, okay? You, you cover space with tetrahedra that, that, that are connected. So uh, uh, you have neighboring tetrahedra, uh, and neighboring tetrahedra, they somehow uh, sandwich in between triangles, okay? And uh, that's a very nice, um, the, the, the thing is what, uh, what, me, what um, several users of 3D triangulations do, uh, they want to model surfaces embedded in space, okay? And what they want to do is they want to construct surfaces that are not self-intersecting because, uh, well, that does not really exist, self-intersecting surfaces, at least when, when, when we speak about something that is material, okay, that, that you want to avoid. So the fact that the triangles are sandwiched between tetrahedra makes uh, that uh, when, uh, for the surface you construct, you take those a subset of those triangles uh, by construction, they cannot intersect, so they, you have a nice, you have, at least uh, you have a nice surf, surface uh, with, with, uh, with this respect, okay? Let's see at some examples. So, so in Seagull you find um, uh, something that computes surface meshes. Here you see a, a part of a cologne, um, colon. Um, input, medical data, so just voxels, so 3D images. Output. Um, uh, the, the mesh for an ISO value in the image, okay? And um, uh, this thing competes with marching cubes, only that it's nicer, because uh, uh, it's not that you, 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 you generate many, many triangles and then you run simplification algorithms where you have almost no chance to get them topologically, topologically correct. Uh, so this one kind of starts uh, with a, a small mesh and refines where it's necessary to refine it. Okay, so it's a, it's a very nice property. And uh, well, it's uh, important for getting this uh, topological correctness. And, uh, uh, here an example from uh, one of our commercial users, uh, so Ohio State University. What they do, they don't have as, in they also want to produce a surface mesh. As input, they don't have voxel data, but they have a surface mesh. They have uh, this, uh, very, yeah, I mean, if you, it's, it's, a, it's a very dense, it's a very dense surface mesh, okay? And um, um, here you see kind of the superposition of uh, uh, the, 3D, the 3D triangulation of the spacer. Um, so in gray, you see all these edges of the tetrahedralization. And uh, these lilac uh, facets, these violet facets, they are, they are just embedded, they are, they are just sandwiched between, 
between tetrahedra and uh, now they use this decomposition of space also to navigate around because uh, the decomposition allows you just to 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 to, to explore neighborhoods and things like that okay and uh, so they they produce uh, things like that so it's a remeshing algorithm in a sense in the chapter Voronoi diagrams so Voronoi diagrams are um, are data structures for um, for encoding distances and for for, for for encoding proximity. Okay, what you have here in the, in red is the input. It's a utility, say a, a U.S. A post office. Okay, and uh, now you it decomposes the plane in a kind of cells, and so all those people who live in this cell should go to that, that's the closest post office for them. Okay, everybody living in this cell, that's the closest post office. Okay, that's that's what Voronoi Voronoi diagrams about. We have that for points. So, well, we have it in 2D and 3D. I mean, on the, on the slides, you, you have it in 2D. We have it, um, we have it for circles. For circles, uh, the kind of the, uh, the, um, the arcs uh, which, uh, which express equidistance between two objects, okay, uh, they become uh, arcs of hyperbolas, not straight segments. And we have it for, for segments. So when the input, you have points or, um, or segments. Um, it's Again, in blue, it's uh, the. I mean, um, in in blue, you see the boundaries, the the edges of the Voronoi diagram, and so what a Voronoi edge is, it's uh, the the separate the boundary of uh, of two of two neighboring of two neighboring areas. So when you are here, so you are equally far away from this guy and from from this line. Okay, that's and uh, yeah, remember uh, basic math. So a parabola is defined by uh, by a point and by uh, by by this by this supporting line. Okay, and. Um, the thing in, in, in Seagull, what's nice about it is, is that uh, this parabola, it's, um, it's stored in a symbolic way. So we do not discretize things and say, okay, well, it's a parabola, but let's, uh, let's polygonize it. Let's, uh, on, on the screen, it's polygonized because, okay, ultimately, it's, uh, it's, um, but, but uh, in memory, in the data structure itself, uh, it's, uh, it's an exact parabola, okay? And uh, it's compact because it's just described by uh, uh, the... the, the the defining line plus uh, plus this one point uh, plus a start and an end point. Uh, so it's a uh, yeah it's a it's a compact representation, uh, which is important if you want to treat big models. Uh, then then it must be compact. You cannot discretize. Uh, the the Voronoi diagrams for segments they are also interesting because when you uh, when you have segments that form up a polygon, then uh, the, the the Voronoi diagram is a medial axis, okay, which is a, a well-known structure of uh, morphology, image morphology, things like that. Okay, so um, the medial axis, uh, well, it has uh, it has these parabola arcs, and for many people, they don't like parabola arcs so much because, well, when you run C, when you try to control CNC machines, also then. Uh, well, parabola arcs, they somehow they are not built into uh, how you can move, uh, move tools. So what, uh, what many people, um, I mean, we have several users uh, which use an alternative to medial axis. It's called straight skeletons. It's also a skeleton of an input object, okay? But the, uh, the, the thing is that uh, here are no parabola arcs, uh, so which, uh, yeah, which, makes it, uh, which makes it interesting, as I said, for, for CNC, for milling machines, printing machines, uh, okay? And uh, people use it for computing offsets. And they need offsets because they want to move a, a machine uh, around to, uh, to mill, okay? To, to produce uh, something uh, which has uh, this, given, this given shape. Uh, in the chapter, bounding volumes, uh, uh, the fundamental cause in computational geometry starts with convex hull. What's a convex hull? You are given an object and you want to know what's the smallest polyhedron containing it, uh, which is something important because uh, when, you, when you want to, uh, say you, you have collision detection. So before figuring out, uh, do, do I hit this bunny uh, in a game with my, with my hand? Uh, you've, you better first test, uh, do I hit the bounding box uh, of the bunny or do I hit... Uh, uh, the, the convex hull of the bunny because that's computationally uh, much cheaper, okay? And so uh, then we have things like um, uh, the bounding sphere. It's uh, the smallest sphere containing uh, uh, a point set. Or we have things like uh, uh, a bounding sphere of spheres. You have a collection of input spheres and, uh, okay, and you want to know what's the smallest sphere. So there, um, yeah. Um, in the chapter Boolean operations, uh, we have we have a uh, Neff polyhedra. They are called. Uh, it's a professor in, in Switzerland called um, Professor Neff. So um, it's it's a it's a very uh, sound mathematical definition of 
uh, how how, um, how objects uh, how, how objects should be should be represented. It's sound, uh, which makes that uh, it's closed under Boolean operations, uh, which has this implication that you can have uh, you can have an object with an, a 1D antenna sticking out. Uh, things that that usually modeling tools uh, kind of regularize away. They just throw it away because uh, uh, if you want to manufacture it, uh, well, something uh, which is one dimensional. You, it makes no sense, right? You cannot, you cannot manufacture it. But there are applications where you want to, you want to maintain a, a one-dimensional features or, or, or two-dimensional or two, or, or two features. So we don't enforce this, this uh, regular re regularization. And well, well, Boolean operations is you have uh, that object uh, and you want to subtract uh, this object uh, and uh, you obtain that object, okay? That's, that's what Boolean operations are about. So I should have shown that before. I apologize. Um, um, the thing is, because uh, we use uh, the exact computing paradigm, so we will speak later about it, uh, um, these operations, uh, they're, they're kind of, you can give whatever nasty input, it will, uh, it, it will not crash and it will produce a result. Okay, that's, um, that's kind of, well, yeah. that's what it's supposed to do. Um, let's switch to another thing, uh, Boolean operations. What we see here is uh, a printed circuit board. Okay, and uh, but uh, given uh, given as a uh, given as a cat file, let's so uh, let's let's zoom in, uh, and uh, what we see is that uh, what looked like a little black dot uh, is in reality. I mean, that was the little black dot we saw in the, the the contact that we saw in the very beginning. So when you zoom in, and then you see that uh, the little black dot consists of lots of little cigars, uh, which are again tooling paths. Uh, so it, it's a it's in a sense it's a tool moving around uh, like that, stopping here. And the tool has a round cap, and that's why, why it's round at the end. Okay. Now this uh, this printed circuit board was kind of constructed by uh, moving this pen, with, which has a certain width uh, around, and covering the thing. And um, um, what we offer is Boolean operations uh, on polygons, uh, where um, where the the edges of the polygon can be arbitrary curves. Uh, well, can be uh, can be conics. Okay, so it can be uh, uh, arcs of circles, for example. And again, the important thing is we don't do it with discretization. The thing is that when you start discretizing uh, the model you saw initially, uh, well, you need uh, you, you need not uh, you need a lot of memory. Okay, and uh, you also you have no guarantee that uh, uh, that uh, I mean you have to pay attention that. You, you sample, um, you, you approximate uh, the circular arc uh, dense enough uh, so that you guarantee that uh, the output is, uh, is correct. Parameterization. Parameterization is about flattening cows. It's, um, if you want to put it in front of your chimney or if you want to put uh, texture mapping on, on an object. Now here, uh, what we did is um, you, there's, uh, um, the, there's, a cut, there, there's a cut line, cut line on, under the cow, and uh, so flattened, it looks like that. Uh, here are the eyes, uh, because the thing is, when you flatten something out, uh, there's, there is distortion. Okay? You cannot, I mean, take a half of an orange, uh, you cannot, I mean, if you press it down, it just, uh, uh, yeah, it just, uh, uh, it doesn't stay, uh, it doesn't keep um, as this. So the same here, so if you, if you flatten an object, uh, you, you, you have to distort. So color coded, you see how big the dis distortion is. So it's very, it was very big at, uh, uh, at the eyes. Okay. Uh, now in Seagull, you find uh, uh, the major, uh, we find implementations for the major methods uh, of, uh, of surface parameterization. Then uh, mesh simplification, you have an input mesh uh, here on the left. Uh, and uh, if you only want to to, to put texture on it, uh, then this is an overkill. You don't need that fine triangle. So, so simplification algorithms, what they do is uh, they, con they, they construct uh, a new surface mesh which has far less triangles, but tr which c maintains uh, uh, the essential features. Okay, I mean, you see that uh, um, this, let's say this, uh, this V color of, uh, uh, well, it kind of, you, you find it again, or the nose remains the nose, uh, the wing, uh, you have elongated edges, uh, uh, at, the, at, this, at, this part, at this part of the wing. So here maybe two, two highlights is, uh, um, well, no, um, the highlight here is that the way it was implemented, uh, we were uh, when we did it, we were inspired by the Boost Graph Library, which, uh, which uh, very nicely separates uh, uh, algorithms running on graphs uh, from uh, data structures representing graphs. Uh, so we applied the same thing um, to I mean, if just if, if you know if you know uh, what um, if you know a little bit about BGL, then this speaks to you. Otherwise, it won't. Um, in the section detection, 
the thing is when you simplify, then uh, you have a high chance uh, that you end up with triangles uh, that, that intersect. So what you have in, uh, what you have in Sega, uh, so let's, zo let's look at this model, let's zoom in, uh, uh, color coded. Here you see uh, an area which is, uh, which is red, so let's zoom in again. You see that uh, what happens there, that uh, the simplification algorithm somehow it messed uh, the surface up, and so the surface became self-intersecting by, uh, by the simplification. So in Sega what you have is uh, an, uh, an intersection detection algorithm, which is rather degeneric in the sense that uh, the user provides uh, um, uh, provides uh, the bounding box uh, for the objects uh, you want uh, to, 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 to detect uh, the intersection of. The user provides a callback uh, that the algorithm calls uh, for, uh, for any pair of uh, objects that intersect. I mean, in this case, uh, two triangles uh, uh, who, who, uh, who, over, yeah, who, who overlap. And uh, it comes in, in two flavors, one for uh, just a set of, uh, of objects and uh, you get all pairwise intersections, or you have a flavor where it comes, uh, you, have, you have two sets, A and B, and you get, uh, you get all objects uh, uh, from one set and from the other set, uh, which are kind of in conflict, and uh, the callback gets, gets applied. And this, this thing is, uh, it's tuned for speed, huh? so it's, uh, it, yeah, it's tuned for speed. Um, Things, we have in Seagal things like estimation of curvatures. So, I mean, here you, here you see, uh, well, on the model we saw before, uh, the, the maximum curvature. Here you see it on the lips. So if, you, if you see if it goes, it goes around the lips. Uh, and min curvature goes along the lips. And the same here on the wings. So you see it goes, uh, it goes around uh, this, uh, this cylindrical part. Uh, and this goes along the cylindrical part. Uh, Part. So what, what these kind of uh, estimators are used for is for ridge detection. When you, when you, have, uh, you, you have models, uh, you have scanned them with a scanning device, uh, you, you have a polyhedral model of that, uh, and uh, now you want to figure out uh, where is the ridge, uh, where is the sharp edge, uh, so where is the uh, ridge of a table, things like that. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the last example, natural neighbor interpolation. So, uh, some, uh, so what you see here on the right uh, is... Uh, um, it's weather data. It's uh, every red dot uh, is uh, a city in Japan, and uh, the L and uh, it's a little bit higher if it's a little bit warmer. And uh, what Weather News wanted to do is uh, they wanted to interpolate weather data on a regular grid, uh, so on this on this white point. Uh, and uh, they used um, a natural neighbor interpolation from from Seagull for that. So again, here you have your you have your points uh, which define uh, temperatures. Uh, and uh, what you do if you want to interpolate for this guy uh, the temperature at this point, uh, so. Uh, you, you take into account those who, uh, who, are, um, who are neighbors in, in the Voronoi diagram. You first compute the Voronoi diagram here in black of, um, of only the red guys. So you see this guy influences this zone, so that, that city influences this zone and so on. And now you kind of virtually, uh, you simulate uh, inserting uh, this, uh, this, black, this black dot, uh, this new, well, this, the point for which you want to interpolate. Uh, um, it claims this. It claims influencing this zone, so it's Voronoi zone. And uh, now the fraction of uh, uh, of uh, the area, um, yeah, the, the the fraction of area contributed by uh, by this city kind of uh, inf well uh, says how, how we how we weight uh, uh, the temperature here to compute uh, the, the the temperature at that point. Okay. Now. Um, to at least see some code. In the beginning I said it's a C++ class library, so where's the C++? Here we go, hello world in Seagull. Uh, as in any C++ program, you first include uh, some header files. I told you that uh, our I mean, you, you include the, the Deloney triangulation, so uh, the data structures you're interested in. I told you that uh, uh, all our data structures need kernels, uh, so providing points, uh, orientation tests, and, and the such, so we also have to include a kernel. Uh, yeah, we, we make the long name a little bit shorter using a type def. Uh, so in the, ker the kernel provides us a point type. Uh, there's the Deloney triangulation, which is parameterized by, by a kernel. And uh, uh, the Deloney triangulation, it has vertices, faces. So it needs uh, entities to, uh, yeah, to refer to, to, to vertices and faces. Now the main routine comes. Uh, we allocate the Deloney triangulation. We insert points coming from standard in. So this builds up uh, the triangulation we saw on, on, on this very first slide. Now for the origin, point zero, zero, uh, we determine the nearest vertex. 
the, the closest vertex to, uh, to the origin, okay, and uh, we print that out. I mean, it, it's a stupid example. You wouldn't run an n log n algorithm for a linear time problem. It's only to illustrate uh, two things. So one thing is uh, um, uh, templates all over the place. Uh, so Silvan will speak about templates. And uh, then the thing, I, I, I said there are kernels. Uh, and uh, then the, the kernels come in different flavors for exact predicates, inexact constructions. And, well, Silvan will shed more light uh, on, on that aspect. Thank you. OK, so now let me um, show you exactly how we use uh, generic programming in Seagal and what is um, specific to Seagal in generic uh, programming. So let me highlight the differences in overall general design between the STL and Seagal. Uh, in the STL, you have um, algorithms. Uh, you have some freestanding algorithms, like STD sort, for example. And um, so this is uh, this uh, orange box here. And these freestanding algorithms are uh, completely decoupled uh, from the um, underlying data structure uh, sequence uh, on which they run. Uh, they interface with that through the iterator concept. And uh, so the iterator is um, representing a sequence, which is uh, usually stored in a container, for example. And this container store, uh, stores values. Uh, the algorithm can query uh, some properties on the values, like an ordering, for example, through some functors, uh, which is also a concept uh, this way. You also have another set of algorithms which are more tightly coupled to the containers. Uh, they are less generic. Uh, I refer here to, for example, the sort member function of a standard list or the insert function of a standard set. Now, with this picture in mind, uh, the, difference, the differences that we have in Seagal is that um, the objects that we, that we manipulate are not only sequences. We have uh, more complicated graphs, and the geometry is also um, the geometry of points or curves in the plane or space is more complicated than just an ordering. So um, the first main change is that we have to query uh, the properties of the objects, the points, uh, through uh, several uh, functors, predicates, when we have an algorithm. Uh, usually one is not enough. So we have uh, some bundles of functors, typically, which we uh, gather in what we call the geometric traits class uh, concept, um, which is a property of each uh, algorithm. Another difference, as I mentioned, is that um, we do not only manipulate sequences. So for example, a convex hull in 2D is only a sequence. But if you think of it in 3D, it's already more complicated. Or triangulation in 2D is also more complicated. So uh, for some algorithms, we have uh, a graph interface, which we have tried to base on the Boost Graph Library concepts for graphs. Uh, this allows to run the Boost Graph Library uh, algorithms um, on the Seagal data structures. And we also have some, uh, let's say, algorithms which are tightly coupled to uh, data structures, like the insert function of triangulations, um, for example. Another refinement which we have, just like in the BGL, is that uh, some algorithms provide visitors um, that are some callbacks which are available to users uh, to be um, uh, to be called at specific events within the execution of each algorithm. So this is the overall picture. So we tried to stick to something familiar, uh, which is the STL, and extended it to our uh, specific needs. So now let me show you some, some code. So this is uh, what we have in the STL, so the, the, the class set, which is parameterized by the key type and the comparison functor less. Uh, which provide the, the ordering. So you, you internally store a, an object of this uh, functor type here, and you call it, since it's a function object, on the, the, the key types, so the one that you want to insert in the, in the set. So in Seagal, we have something very similar to that. Um, so as I said, the geometric traits class here is gathering 
the point types uh, and the various functors specifying the predicates. So in this example here for the Delaunay triangulation, we use two functors, the orientation functor and the um, in-circle uh, test, which Andreas uh, showed at the beginning. And when you insert a point in this triangulation, you will need somewhere in the code uh, calls to this uh, orientation functor and in-circle tests. So this is um, very similar in design to the STL. Let me now give more details on this geometric traits class parameter. Uh, the idea of having this as a template parameter is that you can easily change it. And you want to do that because uh, you would like to change the point types. Let's say you want to use a SIGAL algorithm within your application, which already has a point type, for example. And you are now able to, to use SIGAL algorithms on your point types uh, because of this flex flexibility. You can also exchange the, the predicates that run on these point types, so computing the orientation of three points, for example. Um, SIGAL itself provides several models uh, for this geometric traits class. Actually, we call them kernels. Uh, they are uh, some kind of superset of um, uh, the needs of geometric traits classes of many algorithms in SIGAL. So they are gathering uh, basic functionality on, on points, segments, etc. And the models that we provide are uh, parameterized themselves by the arithmetic. That is, you can change, uh, you can use, for example, doubles as coordinates, or floats, or ints, or uh, more involved number types like multi-precision integers, which I will uh, de describe later. There is here some kind of speed precision trade-off and uh, some adaptability reasons. Um, to give you a practical example of another thing that it is useful for, Andreas described uh, the application of terrains, uh, which is made using the, the Seagal uh, 2D Delaunay triangulation. And this is simply achieved by using some kind of implicit projection traits class, uh, which takes 3D points and um, applies 2D predicates to them. So it's, it's very easy to plug in a specific traits class implementing this uh, within the 2D Delaunay triangulation. OK, now let me give uh, more detail on the exact geometric computing paradigm that we use in many places in Seagull to achieve robustness. So there are some issues which are especially important in geometric computations. Uh, if you naively use uh, floating point arithmetic in geometric algorithms, uh, then you may have some um, unexpected consequences. You may, for example, uh, produce some wrong output or slightly wrong output, let's say convex hull is not really convex, that may or may not be a problem for your application. Uh, worse, you could have a crash because your algorithm or data structure is going to encounter uh, an invariant violation. Or even worse, you could also have an infinite loop in the algorithm due to this. This, this can happen very easily. Uh, and the thing is that uh, fundamentally there is a gap between the geometry which is used in theory, which is the one that you use to build your algorithm uh, in, the, in the literature, and the geometry which is actually provided when you use floating point arithmetic. So let me give more insight on this. Uh, typically, algorithms are proved, at least their correctness is proved, um, uh, based on some th basic theorems of geometry. Here I have an example. If you take four points in the plane, P, Q, R, and S, and uh, you have the hypothesis that the three small triangles are oriented uh, counterclockwise, so that, that's what the CCW means. Uh, so the three small uh, triangles, S, Q, R, uh, P, S, R, and P, Q, S, then uh, you have a theorem that says that uh, the larger triangle, P, Q, R, is also oriented counterclockwise. So it's a theorem that is used uh, to prove the correctness of some algorithms. Now what happens with, uh, with doubles? Um, this counterclockwise test is the orientation test of three points, PQR, and this is actually the sign of a two-dimensional determinant uh, when you refer to the Cartesian coordinates of the points, so PX, RX, etc. You have the formula here. Now, if we pick um, a particular example, 
uh, you pick the point P and Q on the main diagonal with these coordinates, so one half, one half for P, and uh, 24, 24 for Q. And you pick a third point R, which is uh, very close to P. Uh, and we actually zoom in on this area, and we paint the color of the result of this orientation test that we get with doubles. So R is uh, actually very close to P, uh, very close being that uh, the zoom square here um, corresponds to 256 uh, consecutive values of floating point numbers. So this is very close to the point P. And you see that uh, the computed orientation value uh, using floating point is uh, actually very far from what it should be uh, with the exact uh, theoretical geometry, which should be only one main diagonal of yellow squares. So here you have some kind of random area along the diagonal, which means that here you have some values you, which you hardly can predict. You, you even have some inversions if you look at some specific cases here. So this means that with such an orientation test, you absolutely cannot rely on some theorems to, pr to prove your correctness of, of the algorithms. And you actually run into, into trouble in practice as well. So the solution that we try to advocate in Seagull, because it's general, is the exact geometric computation. Uh, it means that um, we do not uh, strictly rely on exact arithmetic, which means costly computation, but it is a refined scheme of this. The idea is that you can guarantee the robustness of your algorithms if your predicates are exact, because your algorithms are going to take decisions during the execution based on the results of these predicates. And as soon as you guarantee the, the exactness of the predicates as a whole, then it is, it is okay, you, have, uh, going to, you are going to have uh, um, robust algorithms. Sometimes uh, you observe that construct geometric constructions can have uh, more approximation and it may not be uh, a problem. So for example, in meshing algorithms, if you construct a new point, it, it need not be exactly, uh, let's say, the circumcenter of, uh, of three, other, three other points. It may have a little bit of error. Um, we use for this uh, some arithmetic tools, uh, multi-precision uh, integer and rational numbers, multi-precision floating point numbers, so there are libraries like GMP and PFR which provide this, and also some more involved uh, algebraic numbers of low degree. Uh, interval arithmetic is also used to control uh, in an efficient way the round of error of floating point numbers, floating point operations. And in some places, we even use some static uh, analysis of the round of error propagation within the uh, predicates code. So let me give uh, just a review of what, uh, how we use this uh, in practice in Seagull. So typically, we have uh, generic functor adapters. So there is this example of the filtered predi predicate class, which is actually um, uh, producing a predicate based on two instantiations of a given predicate code. So if you have the orientation predicate uh, instantiated with interval arithmetic, you can run it first. And the interval arithmetic is going to tell you if uh, the sign computation inside is uh, certain or not. If it's not certain, then uh, you can instantiate the orientation predicate again with some more precise arithme arithmetic like uh, rationals. Uh, the idea is that uh, the, the average speed, the expected speed, is going to be the one of intervals rather than the multi-precision, but you still always have the exact result. Um, so as I said before, there are some refinements of this which are faster than just interval arithmetic using some static error uh, propagation analysis. And also uh, some more progressive um, uh, precision uh, increase than just switching to uh, fully rational uh, numbers. Now a typical benchmark uh, that illustrates exactly what, what kind of speed we, we get with that. If you compute a 3D DNA triangulations of 1 million random points, uh, if you use doubles, then you can do it in 13 seconds. 
If you use naive multi-precision, then this is much, much slower, so 800 seconds. If you use the, the filtering scheme based on interval arithmetic and then uh, rational numbers, then you go down to 63 seconds, which is already much more interesting. So it's only four or five times slower than doubles. And with more refinements, you can use so these uh, static filters, which are uh, approximately 20% slower than uh, doubles overall, so which is uh, very good for an exact guaranteed result. Uh, on non-random data sets, then uh, this can be a little bit slower, but you have guarantees. So this was uh, for uh, geometric predicates, but we also have some scheme to have uh, exact constructions in case you need them. Um, this is what we call filtered constructions. That is, um, when you compute, for example, this figure, you start from four points, uh, P, Q, R, and S. They form each uh, two segments, T and U, and then you compute the intersection I between these two segments. Uh, we provide actually a mechanism to compute this exactly, but in a lazy way. That is, we first compute it with interval coordinates, for example, for the intersection points, and we remember in a directed acyclic graph uh, the way that it was constructed in case we need later more precision. Now this scheme of uh, exact geometric computation is uh, not bulletproof. There are some cases that it cannot handle. Uh, there is some work still go ongoing on uh, topology preserving rounding. Uh, there are some um, issues with uh, algorithms that use cascaded constructions, so repeated constructions, because then the size of your DAGs is growing. And uh, finally, uh, there, are, uh, there is work ongoing on improving the efficiency of exact computation with algebraic numbers that you encounter when you manipulate curves, for example. So intersections of circles uh, that Andreas showed uh, previously. Okay, I will let Andreas conclude. So we... Let me just report on what are we currently working on, uh, what, uh, what, you, what can you expect uh, in, in the future. So one thing is uh, par parallelization. So there are multi-core uh, processes out, uh, so it's kind of obvious to, to look at uh, how to get, well, to get data structures and algorithms, uh, well, algorithms faster by, by using um, um, things like OpenMP. There are things like uh, other language bindings, so for the Python language, uh, and things like uh, making uh, toolboxes for Scilab, which is uh, an environment comparable to, uh, to MATLAB. Then there are plugins for, for drawing tools um, and more algorithms and data structures. And uh, well, the, the man with screenshots is back. Um, here, what we see is uh, not generation of surface meshes out of uh, voxel input data of medical data, but uh, a generation of volume meshes. So what you want to do is uh, you have voxel data, the tissues, uh, the different tissues are marked. Uh, and uh, for example, for, uh, for simulating of uh, how does radiation go through the body and how do cells uh, 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 receive energy. So uh, um, people that do these kind of simulations, they need decompositions of uh, the tissues in uh, in, in, uh, in meshes. So what is particular here is uh, that uh, the entire thing is computed in one shot. It's not that a uh, uh, marching cube is running on uh, uh, one tissue after the other and then you try to, to glue the tissues together uh, with, uh, with, with problems at, uh, at the boundaries. So, so all the thing is constructed in, in one single shot. Uh, if you are of my age, you maybe know Asteroid, so it was an arcade game. Um, you have a little uh, spaceship, and when you fly to the left, uh, it just wraps around, and you, you arrive here again. The same for these asteroids. They flow out uh, on the top, so it comes back in the end. The thing is, uh, it's called periodic spaces, and uh, what we do is uh, um, there is work underway on offering um, geometric algorithms in periodic spaces. So that's interesting for, um, uh, for people who, uh, uh, who, don't like, um, uh, who don't like boundary conditions. So the thing is that... Uh, that's kind of the equivalent to uh, the screen we saw before. What we do in this, uh, in this area, we have points in there and we triangulate them. And instead of triangulating 
the convex hull, what we do is so we connect the triangles out uh, to the right, uh, coming in back, the edge coming, coming back on the left. Okay, so uh, if, if you look at uh, this triangle here, it's the, it's the same triangle than this triangle here, okay? They, they are connected. It's, it's the same triangle in, in memory, in, in the data structure itself. Okay, and uh, uh, now this allows, so now we, we, we just, if, if we follow uh, how, how a point um, would move in, in such a triangulation, now we see it enters a triangle and it kind of wraps around, so it jumps to the other side and uh, the walk in the triangulation kind, kind of continues. So here you saw it in 3D, in 2D. Uh, it's, in, it's under development for in, in 3D and uh, yeah, there are people like cosmologists uh, which, which are interested in these kind of, uh, kind of applications. Um, another thing is uh, geometry on the sphere. So it's not geometry in the plane but uh, on, on, on the sphere. So, uh, here you see uh, an arrangement, so uh, uh, yeah, uh, a, pl a, pl a planar graph, and the edges here, they they are straight, uh, they they are arcs of great circles. Okay, so so they are round, uh, but they are not round, uh, say uh, like uh, like a half circle, but uh, they are round on this uh, on this uh, on this round surface. Okay, uh, then there are algorithms like a Voronoi diagram, so on the sphere, and things like a map overlay. So let's take the two the two. Uh, planar maps we saw before, the, the overlay would compute uh, the, the new intersection points and decompose it further in, uh, in phases. Okay, um, to, to, to sum it up, uh, so what we tried to, the, yeah, what we tried to tell you, so uh, Seagull, it's a, it's a large collection of data structures and algorithms, so with a very uniform design because, uh, well, there's a, there's, the, there's a kind of process of, Silva mentioned that, uh, this reviewing process where we pay very careful attention to that things are very uniform and uh, that, that it's kind of you're, you're homogeneous for, for the users. So another important point is uh, it's a dual licensing scheme, so it's not a purely religious uh, open source, it must be open source. So for those who cannot, uh, yeah, who, who cannot respect such a license, there are, there are alternatives. So in the project, uh, we, fo we focus on geometry, so we don't try to have a general purpose library. What we do instead, we try to interface to make it as easy as possible to interface with existing stuff, like Boost Graph Library, the STL. I mean, you saw examples for that. Um, there are two paradigms we adhere to, generic programming. The main purpose for adhering to it is make it easy for users to integrate stuff. It's, it's generic programming is really about uh, adaptability, about uh, uh, make it easy to integrate. And uh, the other paradigm, uh, the exact geometric computing, make it robust, make it really, uh, that it doesn't crash. I mean, if there's a bug, then it crashes, but it will not crash for problems with uh, floating point arithmetic, things like that. And this filtering, to have it fast at the same time, robust and faster. And uh, so we end here. Thanks a lot for your attention. Any questions? Uh, Sylvain, Mia are, are ready to take your questions. We'll take... We'll take questions now. Um, this talk is being uh, broadcast to the public, so keep that in mind. Um, and uh, if anybody's interested in lunch with the speakers, we'll be having lunch as soon as we're done with the questions. Thank you. So I had a question about the exact computation. Um, the, when do you decide to move from one computational domain to the other, like from rational arithmetic to the algebraic? Um, so the, the need is actually triggered because uh, when you use, for example, interval arithmetic to, to, to uh, compute your predicates, inside your predicate you have this sign function or comparisons. And when you compare two intervals, uh, you may not always uh, have a certain result uh, output. So if two interval overlaps, then um, what is done is that, so it may trigger an exception, a C++ exception, or you may also report this through another mechanism uh, by your special return type. Uh, we actually use both uh, methods for efficiency. And in this case, um, then uh, we actually call the same, the same algebraic code. So when you saw the, the expression for the orientation predicate, sine of px, so this is encoded in a templated function. So you, you had this instantiated with a rational number type, for example, 
and you call this again, and in, in this case, in, it cannot fail. So you, you have the finally the exact result. Did I answer your question? Thanks.